Welcome everyone to this month's edition of Food Co-op Initiatives free webinars. Today we are very pleased to have Bonnie Hudspeth with us. She was a project manager for the award-winning Monadnock Co-op in Keene, New Hampshire and now works with the neighboring Food Co-op Association as their membership and outreach coordinator. Uh, before she starts, just a couple of little details to get through. Uh, we want to, of course, thank all of our sponsors, uh, without whom this would not be possible. And the primary sponsors are the USDA's Rural Co-op Development Program. And there we go. With significant help from CDS Consulting Co-op, National Co-op Grocers, Blooming Prairie Foundation, and National Cooperative Bank. And we really appreciate their support, not just for webinars, but for all of the work we do. And in addition to those, the food co-ops of the United States and their members are also helping us significantly. From this map, you can see it's a new world out there. Uh, we've got a lot of new co-ops open. And in fact, we're up to about 140 currently organizing communities now across the United States. So uh, you're not alone. And uh, be sure to you be in touch with the other people doing this work. They'll be happy to talk to you and help. Next month, we will have a presentation on branding. And if you are familiar with marketing terms, we're talking about how we present ourselves as a business in the public view, both in the store and in public media. Uh, it's a broad topic with a lot of importance to us both in the startup phase and once you're open. So I encourage you to come. Our own Jacqueline Hanna is going to be presenting along with Nicole Klemek from the CDS Consulting Co-op. Thanks for all of the help from uh, Mary and Joel in the background. And with no further ado, here is Bonnie. Well, thanks, Stuart. It's great to be able to present and have this opportunity to talk about, go back a little bit in time to my role as project manager for the Monadnock Food Co-op. Um, so today I want to go over, um, Joel, if you could advance to the next slide. I'm going to share a little bit about myself as a context, um, talk about how you can afford a project manager. Um, that's a struggle for startups. Thinking a little bit about what's your role what needs to be done, and leadership structure for starting a successful food co-op. Um, and then to wrap up, considering who's your network and the importance of network and peer support in the success of your startup organizing. Um, and then, of course, we'll have time for questions at the end, which is the most exciting part for me. So my story is that I first came into co-ops through meeting my own needs. I was a happy co-op shopper in all the communities I lived in. I grew up in Burlington, Vermont, and our family was um, in their old location. We used to come and help our parents stock, uh, fill the walnut bags and work in, uh, do working membership program back when they had that back in the day before they moved to become City Market in downtown Burlington. But when I moved to Keene, New Hampshire to start my graduate program um, at Antioch University of New England, I realized that our community did not have a food co-op. And the more that I thought about it and the more that I kind of looked at some of the needs in the region, especially the fact that there were 400 farmers according to the census and no year-round local place to, for them to sell their products, um, one, you know, one thing led to another and I ended up working to start a food co-op for my master's project. I thought, it would, I thought I would help galvanize the community and set up the structure um, for the organizing of a food co-op, but I realized that the more that I got into it, the more exciting it was, and I really wanted to continue making sure this thing succeeded. So I ended up working for about four years um, and became full-time project manager for about a year and a half of that time before handing it over um, right at the time that I wanted to get out, which is operations, because I really don't have experience with operations, and I wanted to give it to someone that would help the co-op thrive. So that was how I got into organizing a co-op. And then now I work for a regional association of 35 food co-ops around New England, and a third of those are startups. So part of my role there is connecting startups to resources like Food Co-op Initiative and other co-op support organizations, and also structuring peer-to-peer -peer support. So 
Um, one of the things, you know, I'm trying today, I have a short amount of time and I really want to take away some of my ahas and lessons learned when I was organizing. And something that took me a while to figure out is there's sort of two different projects when you're acting as project manager for starting a co-op. There's organizing the structure for a democratic association, the cooperative, and then you're also setting up a grocery store. You're dealing with operations. And one of the lessons that I learned after struggling and sweating over operational decisions that I really was not qualified to make was that if you are the startup organizer, if you're still in that pre-operation stage, push all decisions that you can as far into the future as possible, knowing that the general manager will be better equipped to handle them. Um, and I'm talking specifically about organizations. So that was something that really helped. Um, and I also realized that some of the best startup um, project managers are people with community organizing backgrounds. In that beginning, you're really looking to build up your membership to get out in the community and empower the community. You know, co-ops are really about empowering people that are marginalized by the traditional economy. So part of your role as project manager, your chief role, I would say, is empowering the community, teaching people skill set, and working together to build up this democratic association. Not worrying about the color of the walls, the color, your produce selection, if you will carry a certain brand of dog food. Because that can take a lot of time and waste your precious time and resources. So what is your role? Um, you know, as project manager, one of your, you know, the definition of project management is managing risk and understanding the big picture and really having a grasp on what needs to be done and then delegating. Um, it took me a while to figure out how to delegate because sometimes it feels easier to do things yourself than to train other people to do them. But by empowering others, you're going to help the co-op succeed. You're going to help galvanize people that will become future participants and shoppers and hopefully run from, for the board of directors. Um, and that way it allows you to do what's really important for a project manager, which is plan and analyzing. You know, defining roles is important, and you, your chief role as project manager is figuring out what needs to be done and then figuring out how to do it. So um, if you could go to the next slide. So how can you afford a project manager? Um, I think the real question is how can you not? There's a couple of startups that I have been working with in New England, and one of them in particular I kept asking every month, okay, who's your project manager? Have you made that decision? Because they kept telling me they got to a system in organizing where roles were becoming unclear, someone needed to be pushing the project forward and delegating, but it was uncomfortable because there was no specific role or paid staff. So it was all board members with equal power and it became clear that it was really stalling the progress of their co-op. So you'll come to a point in your co-op organizing where you really will need a project manager. You will need someone that wakes up and the first thing they think um, after they brush their teeth is how am I, what am I going to do today to make, bring our co-op one step closer to opening the doors. So it's really important um, to have a paid project manager in place even though they probably will not be getting paid what they should or enough. So in terms of the question of how do you find the funding, one of the first things I would say is get together with, it, when you're transitioning to set up for that project manager, brainstorm a list of funding sources in your own community. Um, at this point, thinking about writing big grants to me seems like you could waste a lot of time doing that and your community is a rich source of uh, resources because your project manager will likely come from your community and I think you can make a really compelling case for, for putting together resources to hire this person. Then go out there and ask. One of the key skills in project management is do not be, you can't be afraid to ask. So um, that's what I did. I you know, brainstormed in the community, had hundreds of coffee shop conversations because at the time I looked, I think I was 25 when I started and I looked younger and people really laughed me off. They didn't really know me. So my first role was building relationships in the community and getting comfortable asking and putting together an appropriate proposal to get funding, knowing that the co-op would not continue moving forward unless we had a dedicated project manager in place. So on the other side of that is how do you avoid dun, 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 the self-perpetuating project manager? Um, some of the co-ops out there have been organizing for a while. You know, startup development is not a short process, but 
a new phenomenon that wasn't really around when I was project manager is more grants becoming available and these grants will help pay for these continuing roles but the dangerous cycle of that is that um, as project manager if you are left with the sole responsibility of fundraising for your own position it could almost take over the majority of your work rather than the work that you should be doing which is trying to figure out how to move the project forward um, so the co-op opens its doors. So Stuart and I were actually talking about this a couple weeks ago and thinking hey wouldn't it be phenomenal if the board of directors actually took on that responsibility or at least a chunk of it to know they were responsible for helping to fundraise for the project managers position so the project manager could continue doing what they were doing to move the project forward. Um, I think this is really important for a couple reasons and one is that as project manager you're, the board has the opportunity to act out what they will eventually be doing with the general manager. They have to practice governance, they have to practice holding you accountable, um, they have to practice supporting and making sure you're getting what you need to do your job well. So I think it's a really important role for the board of directors to practice with the project manager but it's also important for you as project manager to get the support that you need so that you can focus on moving the project forward. So if you are in that role and you're stressed about your own funding, um, I would say immediately when you see your board of directors, bring it up to them. Say, hey, this is taking up too much of my time and we're not going to move forward unless I get your support. Um, and I know the board's overwhelmed as well, but it seems like it would be a really um, huge step forward to, to take that off of your plate or at least help share the load. So speaking of board and project manager, how do you structure your leadership? Um, one of the most important things is building and training your teams. Identify early who you want on your volunteer team as members and also as leaders and think about what is each team leader's responsibility. Um, one of the things that was really important in Monadnock Food Co-op's development was we got to a point where we had lots of volunteers that wanted to do something very specific. They were fine to table at an event but um, they often weren't available and so it became me as project manager tabling at a bunch of events which is really not good use of a project manager's time. So we organized a training of the trainers. You know there were lots of questions that people didn't know how to field and um, the board I think was nervous even by themselves they didn't know they didn't really understand how to respond to some questions especially controversial ones like won't your project crush the farmers market when you open? what will happen to the other natural food store in town and it made them nervous so rather than continuing to feel burnt out as project manager or have one other board member that would go present um, we took a step back and invested time and resources into training the trainers so we trained people that could be leaders of different teams so a volunteer coordinator um, a marketing committee, you know, thinking about all the different committees. That way we were giving them the skills they need. We put together a one or two pager about how to answer difficult questions, um, messaging about co-op membership so that everyone could be on the same team. So that really helped um, where we were in development and I think it's, you know, you'll notice at some point where when you start to feel really, bur before you start to re feel really bur burnt out, you might think, okay, well how do we train more people so that it's not me, two other board members, um, and that those trainers could eventually be asked and called upon to train additional folks. So that was a good learning opportunity. So one of the things that I don't know if any of you have read Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, but one of the things that we realized when we were further along in our startup development was find, who do we need to find and engage for certain phases? And if you're at the membership phase, um, or even if you're moving on to the member loan phase, taking the time to invest in relationships and find and engage um, what Gladwell refers to as the connectors, the mavens, and the salespeople. So the connectors are fantastic at expanding your network, um, which is really important for the membership drive phase of, of co-op development. So they say things like, oh, you should talk to, or have you heard, or let me introduce you to. They're going to be people that are going to connect you to others in the community. Um, the salespeople are really good at persuading people who are unconvinced about what they're hearing that this is something critical to invest in. So one of our the co-ops in our network, Manchester Food Co-op, um, one of the startups, has done a phenomenal job at getting building up their membership base. They already have a thousand member owners and they're 
haven't even opened their doors. They're at the point of capitalizing now. And part of their skill sets is that they're excellent salespeople. They have the skill set of being unafraid to ask you to join the co-op and really good at pitching to you why it's in your best interest. So finding these people and engaging them in the appropriate manners to help move your project forward is, um, is a great idea, especially around thinking of your membership, building up your membership base, which is that really crucial first step of your co-op organizing. So as you're creating an epidemic, you also need to consider what needs to be done. Um, and so one thing to think about is what do established co-op stores do when they want to expand? Um, you might not know this, and I don't know the full details myself, but they set up systems. One of the first things is they set up preparatory systems, they engage people, and they think about who, how, and what. So who should be doing what, how do you want to create your team, and what skills are required to do it. So, for example, if you're planning your timeline out and you've read uh, How to Start a Food Co-op Manual, which Stuart and uh, some other partners are going to be updating for us, which is very exciting. Thinking about um, you know the timeline of your co-op development, and then getting the people lined up to to actually be able to do the skills needed. Um, so one of the things that really helped for me, and I would recommend it for all project managers, is having weekly. That is right, weekly dates with your board president or someone from the board that can act as a mentor to you. So what happened for me is, uh, that's the board in the photo you see right now, um, or on the slide, there's a picture of me and Joe Marks, the board president of Monadnock Food Co-op, um, and we decided to have lunch dates around town once a week. And the, the goal of these was prioritizing time. There's a lot, a lot of project management is managing the timeline of development. So we would go have a lunch date at some visible place in town, we would eat outside when we could in the summer, and we would harass people to join. We would always have membership brochures in our pocket. So part of our issue was being out in the community as the board president and project manager, being able to engage folks. Um, but also, for me, it was getting that support on prioritizing time. So how do you prioritize your time? Uh, one of the things that Joe asked me, which was a great question that I thought I knew the answer to, was how do you, what's the weekly average of time you're spending on certain topics? Um, so I, when I did, this was an analysis probably right before our member loan campaign, I realized that I was spending 50% of my time doing volunteer support and management. So that's huge, um, and it, it was unsustainable. So because of that, being, having that analysis on a weekly basis, I could see what the crucial um, task was, and I could also see where do I need to get support. So after I was able to understand that, um, I immediately spent, I think, an entire week's worth of my time finding and training a volunteer manager, a volunteer coordinator to take, to help me take that off my plate. Um, so that's that was a great lesson, and Joe helped me to do that every week. You know, get someone that's outside of your family and friends network. You know, part of that leadership team to ask you and help you prioritize your time so that you're making sure you're moving in the direction that you need to, appropriate to the stage of development where you are. So, um, and part of, you know, one of the most important things that I learned, it took me a while to learn, was analyzing what, um, you know, what is going to have, what's going to have the biggest impact in terms of what I'm doing on a daily basis. You know, if you have eight hours in a day that you're working, how are you going to best be efficient and meet the goals that you're, you know, meet the goals so that you can move forward with project management? So um, you're going to have lots of opportunities come up, and I'm putting opportunities in quotes because people in the community are going to ask you to do a lot of things: start a buying club, start a small downtown location, sell something at the farmers market. You're going to get a lot of asks and opportunities from the the community and it's really a leadership test for you to be able to say is this going is this opportunity to present it going to help me efficiently open the doors of our co-op if the answer is no then just say no so this I put together this little chart because I realized we needed to step back and analyze what was being most what was most effective in getting us member owners 
Um, and I realized that a lot of the things that we were doing involved high time commitment with low results. So we were tabling at every organization in the community and its brother. And we weren't really getting, you know, volunteers were going out and they would get one member. I mean, average of probably 0.5 members from this tabling. And it was taking a lot of time and it was taking a lot of the volunteer power that I had. So that I had organized. So what we figured out was to f analyze and focus on or uh, events that had low commitment with high results. And for us that was house meetings or we called them co-op potlucks where you could get member own, you know, empower member owners to bring together 20 or so of their friends, get there, get someone there, either a board president, project manage manager, and you could show up, you could get fed, and you could um, present about the co-op and with the sole purpose in this organizing of being like, bring your checkbooks, sign up for the co-op. This is an opportunity to learn more about the co-op, ask questions, and if you're feeling comfortable and ready, join. So that, you know, I would walk away from a co-op potluck with 12 to 15 new members. That didn't happen every time, but it was a way of empowering your member network to be a part of the success of the co-op organizing and the membership recruitment. So having that step, you know, I think not just the project manager, but the project manager and board setting time aside to analyze uh, your events, what's, you know, what makes the most sense, um, I think is really important because I know there's always ideas you test out, like doing demos, doing uh, tabling at farmer's markets and stuff, but I think you really got to analyze and at some point realize you're going to have to step back from getting out to all the community events and choosing one a week or even one a month when you get into the member loan campaign phase. Um, so you want to make sure that you're getting the biggest bang for your buck. And crucial to co-op organizing is leadership renewal. And it's, it's really one of the biggest hurdles for startup organizers is burnout. Um, I think you probably have all experienced that already. I mean, you might feel burnt out yourself, but also your board members, your volunteers, there is going to be burnout. And so to try to avoid being stuck in a really rough spot, thinking, looking at the development timeline, you know, between each of the stages, you should be planning for a refresher in your team. You should be planning for leadership renewal so that you're not left high and dry because your volunteer manager feels so burnt out halfway through the member loan campaign that he or she is no longer able to do that duty and then you're stuck at a very hard time without that role. So um, I think that's having, you know, both on your board checking in with them regularly before these big transitions in events, um, you know, before your member loan campaign, before a 500 member owner hurdle, just checking in and saying, how are you all feeling? Do we need to bring in a new, you know, fresh, some fresh board members at this phase or steering committee members? Um, and you will avoid being in a situation where you're left without someone critical at a time that's hardest for you as project manager. So when you're preparing to open, woohoo! The best part of startup organizing. Um, one of the most important things, you know, at this point there will probably be a transition in leadership. For lucky co-ops, you'll have time, you know, at a, for like a long time to of overlap between project manager and general manager, um, but one of the things that your role as project manager can be gearing up is put your members to work. Um, you know, members are really antsy. It's probably been at least two to three years, maybe four or five, maybe more, that member owners have been waiting for a co-op, and it's really empowering to them if you're like, hey, we need you. Um, get out into the community, spread the word, um, and that's the time where people, I think, are most excited, and they really want to get out there and do something tangible to help the co-op open its doors. So having, you know, when the co-op opens, organizing volunteer greeters, um, you can do that way ahead, you know, towards the end of those stages. At this point, your capitalization should be complete. So as project manager, um, you're really helping to transition with the general manager and you're helping to set, you know, engage member owners in a way so that when the store opens, it will be jam-packed and, um, it will give everyone a role and, and feel like they are part of the success because they are. So, you know, one of the things to think about, you know, fo besides focusing on roles is what 
you know, when I'm thinking about what makes startups initiatives successful, a part of that is peer support networks. So um, when the Neighboring Food Co-op Association started, a group of uh, co-op general managers around the Connecticut River Valley in New England said, hey, we feel really isolated. We're each in our own communities. We know we're doing good things, but we don't know what's going on with your co-op. We feel isolated. So they created this structure to have better peer support and to work together towards the same values. So they had an early t-shirt that said no, lang no longer blanking in isolation. And that means, you know, managing, uh, no longer organizing, fill in the blank for your own startup. But find, you know, part of that is finding expertise and connecting with others, other co-ops and other startups who have are maybe a little further along in the development phase. And they don't need to be your neighboring co-op. They could be someone across the country. Um, and learn from other startups. You know, if you are not, if you haven't already, uh, once this call is done, get get onto your Facebook page and like, go to Food Co-op Initiatives and see all the startups that they like and like them and follow them on Facebook and connect with them, see what they're doing well and how you can learn. Um, because I think that's a really important part of avoid, you know, of making our organizing processes more efficient is learning from each other and taking, picking the best practices from either established co-ops near you or startups in in terms of what they're doing that you d are filling in the skill set gaps, what you your community might not have, and seeing what they're doing well. So you know that consider in your community who is your network of peer support. You can see up these um, in the map. The milk bottle with apples are all the open stores, and all the green thumbtacks are store food co-op startups that will have stores open. So what we have really tried to do is hook these startups up with the appropriate established co-op nearby or maybe somewhere in this network that can help them figure out what, you know, something that they might be missing in, in terms of their organizational planning. Um, and also, I think it adds credibility. If you can tap into a network and, you know, in the case of neighboring food co-op association, for a startup to be able to say, I am part of a network that of co-ops that is owned by 90,000 people across New England. We generate $255 million in revenue and $50, $50 million in local purchases. It's demonstrating the impact that your startup wants to have when it opens its doors. So you can use the national, what is it called, healthy, I think it's like healthy food, um, healthy communities, the initiative that uh, national co-op grocers did with impact statistics on how co-ops are contributing and that's that's a really important part for your the story of your startup you don't have your you don't yet have your doors open so how can you help tell the story about what co-ops are doing connect to your neighbors and use these statistics to help demonstrate the role of co-ops in the economy and in um, making so you know and in really contributing to the social causes in your area. So planning is key. Um, that, you know, to summarize, planning is really key to successful organizing the startup. Systems, setting up systems and support and figuring out roles and making sure you're structuring teams or you're structuring a campaign well is what's going to lead you to be successful because you really don't have um, you really don't have much resources in terms of time or money to to really make huge mistakes and i think that's i think the more that you're that you're really intentional about setting up structures and teams and analyzing as you're going along um, it's will really help you be successful and just a quick reminder co-ops freaking rock you are creating a business in your community that's owned and controlled by the community, that focuses on service and puts people before profit, that develops local skills and assets. You know, we were just in at CCMA, the National Co-op Conference, and in the Boise Co-op, they have something up on their wall talking about it was something like 80% or more of the employees that they hire for leadership positions come from within their co-op staff. So you're developing local skills and assets. You're empowering people.
with the ability to assemble limited resources. You can join your startup for probably somewhere in the region of $100 to $200, and your startup is going to be a multi-million dollar organization at some point. So it's giving people with less resources the ability to become business owners and have a say, you know, through the board, you know, they can have a seat on the board of directors. Um, it's very empowering. Um, regional economic efficiencies, uh, that's what Neighboring Food Co-op Association has really been w focusing on. How can we, how can we use our, you know, our co-op structure to accomplish more with the local food system? Low business failure rate. Um, co-ops, especially startups, there's a much lower business failure rate. Maybe Stuart can tell you the statistic. Um, but startups are much longer lived than traditional businesses. So why aren't all businesses co-ops? If that were the case, that seems like it would make sense. We're working on it, right? Um, startups are really difficult. Uh, you know, co-ops are difficult to move. You can't buy them out like traditional businesses. And I think that message is really important considering what just happened in with the economic recession. and and also for communities that have experienced grocery stores shutting their doors and leaving because they're not profitable um, for stockholders, that's that's huge, especially in you know in lower income communities. That's a that's we're seeing more and more startups organizing because grocery stores refuse to come to their communities because they're not profitable enough. So the fact that co-ops put people before profit, and you know co-ops are really well structured to member member to mobilize member customer and um, supplier loyalty. So I think just don't forget when you're telling the story of what you are organizing, we, the, the co-op movement is incredibly powerful and I think, I think being, making sure that you tie that into the messaging of, of what you're communicating is really important because it helps people see beyond the nitpicky little question that you're going to get about you know, are you going to sell the product of yogurt that I want? Because if not, I'm not going to join. The more that you can talk about the not, you know, the larger cooperative movement and the roots of our co-op movement, um, you know, back in 1844 were around accessing limited resources and food security for poor mill workers that have been displaced in, in England. So, you know, thinking about getting back to that and incorporating that into your co-op story is really important. And if anyone from Renaissance Co-op is on the call, um, that they've done a really great job. If you haven't checked out their startups video, they've done a great job of communicating why our community needs a co-op. So I think that's been, you know, thinking about how you how you get people, member owners and community members to think bigger picture and to not be come obsessed about what's in it for me. Um, they will anyway, um, but that's part of it is think you know sharing the bigger picture. So I think I've seen some questions being flashed up from yep. Mary. Can you ask me them again, Stuart? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'd be happy to. We have some great questions, in fact. Um, okay. Can you talk a little bit about what the role of, a ma of the mavens are when you had the slide about connectors and uh, you, that wasn't clear? Okay. I didn't really focus on the mavens because I didn't think it was as important as the other two roles. The mavens are the people from what I remember, that know, know a product really well that will go into, um, that will be able to compare things like if you, for example, our neighbor, next door neighbor Craig, when we needed to get a new microwave, we would go to him because he's a maven. He pays attention to prices, he pays attention to if he's shopping, he pays attention to um, things in the store. He know, He's someone that you'd always go to to ask for if you're getting any product. So if you're going to buy a new car, um, so, you know, it's the role of Maven is important, I guess, in that there's someone that's trusted, you would go to them, so if a Maven is able to communicate, well, this is why you should join the co-op, or, hey, I shopped in the last community I lived in, I shopped in a co-op, and co-ops deliver great value for, because they offer high quality food and um, at, a, at a reasonable price. Um, so, someone that, you know, is really trusted, it's almost like a a uh, wise, you know, the word maven, like a wise consumer that you would go to when you're going to get a new barbecue or join a new co-op. Okay. A couple of questions about being paid. Uh, are, yeah. are managers always paid? And what can you say about 
pay structure for that? Sure. So I think what's most important is if you have a if you are a project manager, what do you need to survive? You know, for me, I was coming out of grad school, I had debts to pay. I was getting I was probably working 70 hours a week and getting paid for 40 and I wasn't getting paid what I should have been, but I negotiated with the board and said this is what I need to be paid. So at the beginning, it was I was working I think three different jobs. I was working at a farm, I was working at a green design business, and I was working as project manager for the co-op. That was when it was before it was part-time. So I was um, figuring out how to make it work, and I imagine that might be the case for a number of you, is you just have to you know, piece together what you need to put food on your table and take care of your expenses. Um, so it might mean you know working extra jobs, but I think the most important thing is what what can you afford and matching that up with what someone needs. So if you need to fundraise, so in my case, um, what I did at the beginning was I asked, we went around and we put together a proposal that would include a feasibility study from CDS Consulting Co-op, and, and I included a line on that proposal for total cost, uh, I think it was something pretty pitiful, like $5,000 or $10,000 to pay for project managers. So that at that time it was only five hours a week. You know, that was earlier on in the organizing. So being creative about that, and then when we went around, we fundraised from the community. We got a $5,000 appropriation from city council, a couple thousand dollars from the universities, and um, a, you know, $10,000 $10, from two organizations that were working on development, positive development in the community. So our feasibility and early project management came from our community, which I think is important, and it did not come from member shares, you know, from member equity, because at that time we hadn't even launched our membership campaign. So, you know, being creative in the beginning, but when I got further along in organizing, I'm like, hey, if I'm going to do this as my full-time job, I've got to be paid at, to cover the costs of my living, you know, the basic costs, or at least get as close as possible. So at that point, you know, we had reached, surpassed, I think it was 350 or 400 member owners, and the board knew the co-op's not going to move forward unless we pay someone as project manager. So we actually started using some of the member equity at that point um, to pay for a full-time project manager. And and part of what was happening is I was bringing in additional members. I was also operating on a budget of God knows what, very little. Um, so I was keeping costs very low, getting community donations. I really wasn't, you know, I had a phone line, an office space for a couple hundred dollars a month. Um, and that was about it. So, um, but I think, I think you, and, and I was a contractor. Someone I think had asked a question. Um, and early on, I think it would be very challenging. And, uh, you know, Stuart and others would probably be able to share examples of co-ops that have set up the structure to hire an employee. But to me, that, that takes a lot of things that the general manager really usually focuses on. So I was a subcon, you know, I was a contractor for the co-op up until they hired their first employee, which was the general manager. So that gave them time to set up the structure, and then the general manager, in turn, set up, you know, hired the HR person as the next step, and they were able to set up uh, the structures for employees of the cooperative. I would say that uh, you need to be careful about using the subcontractor relationship. Uh, there, uh, it's being tested more often than it used to, and the rules are pretty specific. You can find them online pretty easily by um, just searching for subcontractor rate requirements or something along those lines. And uh, be sure to do take a look at that and, and get legal advice if you need to, if you're not sure, before you commit to it. It is going to be safer to have the person as an employee, and it is going to be a lot more work. But that's... Right. That's so that, yeah, that's, Stuart hit on some important points, which is that I was my office was in a small business development center in town which made a lot of sense because it was a lot of up-and-coming businesses so we were able to support each other so I definitely had to spend a good amount of time researching that and making sure we were being you know setting up a safe um, situation for my position so but that is that is an important mm -hmm. uh, point. Um, let's see there is a, a good question about whether a prime minister should could be an internal fill, like a volunteer that's doing a great job and gets sort of promoted, yeah. uh, or whether it's better for it to be external. And related to that, 
could, could a board member become a pro, uh, project manager and still stay on the board? Great question. So, you know, in I think it's a really important to pay a project manager. Um, at, even if you're paying them, I think the first question was about volunteer. You could have a volunteer project manager, but there is something different in how you communicate with the community and how you your role with the board and the organizational structure in knowing that it is a job versus a volunteer position. And that this is what I've advised a couple startups who recently have hired project managers is even if they are underpaid, it's much better to, you know, and if they're willing to do that, at least pay them something. And I think that's, it, it affects your mindset and it affects the way that others view you. Unfortunately, or for, you know, it's not necessarily a good thing, but I think it's really important so that you're, you know that your job and you are being paid to be a project manager. Um, in terms of could you still serve on the board, you know, in my case, I thought that it would be organizationally very um, kind of murky if I served on the board and was project manager and then also as project manager was on the committees that, you know, I, I came to all the committee meetings. I thought that would get very organizationally murky. So I actually was never on the founding board of directors. I was on the founding steering committee, and when it came time to form the founding board of directors, I recused myself and put myself on the um, the board structure, you know, on the on the committee to decide how who the first board would be. I felt like that would have been a better role for me. Um, we've had, you know, a, a number of startups I've worked with have actually their project manager before the project manager role existed. One of their board members was clearly in a good position and had the good skills to become a project manager. So in that case, um, from what I know, most of the board members, you know, left the board and took on the role of project manager because, uh, you know, if you're imagining that you're sort of a fill-in for the general manager, you are, it's much clearer organizationally speaking that you are the one that's going up, you're reporting to the board, the board is holding you accountable, they're having systems in place, so it would be very hard to do that for yourself, um, and I think you you know there have to be a lot of executive sessions without you in the room uh, if you were on the board. So I think it to me it makes more sense that um, a project manager would not be on the board of directors. I'm sure there are co-ops that have figured out how to do it successfully, but um, in my experience, it was much more straightforward that I was the project manager and I was reporting to the board. The board was holding me accountable and supporting me. I agree with that, Bonnie. Uh, accountability is, is very different when the rules are clear. Yeah. Um, this one could probably be an entire webinar, but uh, somebody would like to know what to, what to look for and consider when you're selecting your project manager. That's a great question. I put together a project manager do job description. I don't know, Stuart, do you have one on Food Co-op Initiatives research? We have a couple, but I'd sure love to have yours. Yeah, I'll give you, um, I've shared mine around with a number of neighboring food co-op associate member startups and my project manager job description might be, it might be different from, you know, you feel free to tweak it. I, I'll be happy to give it to Stuart and whoever wants to see it. Um, but yeah, I feel like rather than trying to go over that, it's pretty, I put together, it's, I think it's at least two pages worth of what to look for. But, but as I mentioned before, just the basics thinking is you want someone that's, we, this came up a lot at the National Consumer Co-op Conference last week, is someone that really is about empowering others. They're comfortable, they're charismatic, but they don't have a huge ego, meaning they're comfortable getting out and empowering others to be in the community, and they're making it not about themselves, they're making it about our community is working together to start this, and shining the light on others in the community, shining the light on other businesses, shining the light on um, what the volunteers and the founding member owners are doing because that's what a co-op is. You know, it's not about one person. It's about the community coming together to meet their need. So I know that's hard to, that's not a good job description. So I'll, whoever asked the question, we can figure out a way to get that to you and also maybe um, post, you know, put together a job description that we can share out because I think that's something I, I worked with the board of directors to develop and um, a number of startups have used, you know, have customized my initial version, which probably needs to be sorely updated. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll be happy to share that. 
All right, thanks a lot. We might be able to actually post it uh, on the um, on our website on the webinar page as a handout that it would be available right there next to the webinar. So, if that's yeah. okay with you, we'll we'll take a look at that option. Great. One more question, um, and that would be: Is there a best time, in your opinion, for when to start using the project manager? That's a great question. I think, you know, up until, you know, I'm just trying to think about when I started. I think that if you look at the capitalization of the co-op as one of the most in time intensive and challenging things that the project manager will be doing, especially if they their project management ends um, and you have a leadership refresher before operational decisions are made, which is ideal, very few people have the skill set of both community organizer and um, someone that will be an excellent manager of a multi-million dollar grocery store. So to me, you know, thinking of the member loan and capitalization campaign, which is stage three, I believe, you would want someone in place well before that so that they have, you know, that they're well versed with the member owners, that there's a relationship and a level of trust built. Um, so I would say when you know, when you get ready to launch your membership drive, it would be great to have a project manager in place. Um, and if not, get one in place as soon as you can after that because it, there's a lot of things to coordinate as soon as you start launching your, your membership drive and getting new members in because you'll want, you know, in our case, we sent out weekly um, member, weekly communications with members in e, like in e-newsletters. We also thanked everyone for joining and sent them to membership brochures and said please recruit two of your friends to join. So there's a lot of stuff like that that needs someone really coordinating and delegating responsibility. So I would say in my experience, as um, soon as you launch your membership drive, it would be great to have someone in place. Would you agree with that, Stuart? Yeah, and, uh, and that could be pretty early on. I mean, it's right. in the first yeah. stage of organizing when you're starting that member drive. And, uh, I know that a lot of Startups get frustrated by the slow pace, and this is one way to, to really make that happen for you. Yep, exactly. And, you know, think about, I shared a little bit about my story of how, of funding myself, you know, figuring out ways to fund myself, but you can really think about phasing it in. At the beginning, I worked five hours a week, and, you know, the next year, I was able to figure out an AmeriCorps position that allowed me to work half-time by some miracle on co-op organizing. So I worked... 50% of my paid time on co-op organizing. And then the last two years of my organizing, at that point we had enough members in place and um, I had fundraised enough money to pay for myself, or to pay for the position full time. Mm -hmm. So I think naturally you'll you'll phase up in, in terms of the resources you'll have available to pay the project manager. So even if it sounds intimidating to have a project manager in place, when you launch your membership campaign, um, you can it can be a you know a part-time position. It can be less resources involved. Well, we're getting long on time, but I have one last question, which I think is a great one to end it with. What's sure. the most fun thing you did as a project manager? That's a great question. I think you know, to me, getting to the co-op potlucks actually might have been the most fun because it. I was able to go to into houses and meet all the members in a more intimate relationship than tabling. To, I'm, I'm an introvert, um, so project management was exhausting for me. <laughs> it's exhausting for everyone, but my personality is introverted. And so for me to have more intimate interactions with a group of 15 people where we could get to know each other and I could learn about them and build up what felt, you know, the people that when I shop in an ad hoc food co-op, the people that I bump into, that I feel like I know a lot about them and I have these, um, you know, these connections and it feels like friends all over the community from those co-op potlucks. So the, to me that was really fun and it actually was one of the most effective ways to gain membership. So I think that was a win-win. Also mm -hmm. dressing up in a carrot suit, <laughs> an overstuffed carrot suit, I think you saw on the first, one of the first slides, mm -hmm. with some like hat from the 40s, that was really, you have to make yourself laugh. If it's not if you're not having fun doing what you're doing, you're not going to draw members to join because in the beginning it's not about a storefront, it's about the organizing group, whoever that is. 
they, you know, a lot of the start, new startups that I haven't even met yet, but I'm following on Facebook, have done a tremendous job making the co-op a fun place. You know, you are the co-op in the beginning. So, if it involves strapping uh, membership brochures to yourself in a carrot costume, if that's what's fun to you, um, I think it's really important because I think that's that you are building up this perception and reality of the co-op in the community as being something fun and being something that people want to be a part of. So that was a great question and I think it's as a project manager you need things that are going to build up your fun bank. Yeah, well it's a, it's a best practice in, in co-op organizing is keeping fun in front of you all the time. Mm. Yeah. Uh, maybe we have a webinar coming in the future about ways to ha to have fun while organizing a food co-op, and we can include our slideshow of people in various fruit and vegetable costumes, which is I love it, Stuart. I will definitely expensive. sign up to listen on that webinar. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bonnie. This has been great. Uh, we're going to wrap it up here, and uh, thanks again for everybody that helped out and everybody that came to listen. Uh, we've got, uh, again, a reminder that next month we'll be doing a, another webinar at the same time, same place, on branding with Jacqueline Hannon and Nicole Klemek from CDS Consulting. Uh, I think that's all today. We will have the, uh, the webinar up, posted on our website, within uh, usually within 24 hours. So if you know somebody that wasn't able to be here or not able to be here for the whole thing, uh, you'll be able to see it there. And I uh, thank you very much, and uh, have a great day.